Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing cystic fibrosis and cystic fibrosis medications. Okay, right, so we've now discussed the respiratory component of this disease and how it results from the uh, lack of a functional CFTR, okay? Uh, what we now want to discuss is the pancreatic symptoms of this disease. What's going to happen to the pancreas in this disease? And what happens to the pancreas is uh, the origin of the entire name for cystic fibrosis. Okay, it was originally called cystic fibrosis of the pancreas. And then because we realised so many other organ systems are involved, we dropped the of the pancreas, but we maintain the cystic fibrosis. Okay, and we're going to see how in the pancreas, increase you're going to get the formation of cysts and fibrotic tissue, hence the name cystic fibrosis. Okay, right, so again we'll start off with some basic anatomy and physiology of the pancreas so that we can then understand uh, what the loss of CFTR is going to do for the pancreas. Okay, and again, it's going to be very similar to what happens in the lungs. In the lungs we saw that everything goes wrong because of the formation of a very thick, sticky mucus. In the pancreas, again, you're going to get a very thick, sticky mucus being produced, and this is going to clog up the pancreatic ducts, just like it clogged up the submucosal glands and also the uh, actual airways in the lungs. Okay, so I'm going to draw this same picture that I drew um, right at the beginning when we were just discussing the symptoms uh, for the pancreas. Okay, so here is the pancreas, so you have different portions of the pancreas. Uh, over here, this is the sort of tail portion of the pancreas. Uh, I'll move the uh, annotations out of the actual drawing. Uh, this sort of portion is the body of the pancreas. This is the head of the pancreas, and then there is a sort of more drastic little process coming off down here than I've drawn. It's a little bit more drastic than that, but this sort of process down here is what's known as the unsonate process. Okay, right. Now, uh, the pancreas then has a major duct that runs through it, and which loads of other ducts are going to drain into, which I'll draw here. This is the pancreatic duct. It then splits into two, okay, the main pancreatic duct, and then the accessory pancreatic duct, and, bo whoops, and both of these are going to join onto the duodenum. Okay, so if I draw the duodenum, it's a little bit out of scale, it will be a bit bigger than that, but the, the duodenum here, they're going to be draining into the duodenum. Okay, right. Um, in addition, just to complete the picture, uh, another duct actually joins onto the main pancreatic duct here. Okay, like so. And this is the bile duct. Okay, so this is going behind the pancreas. Okay, so imagine that it's behind the pancreas, and then it's joining the main pancreatic duct uh, from behind, basically. Okay, so here is the bile duct, and it will be draining bile into the main pancreatic duct, and then this duct will be uh, releasing the uh, combined contents from the pancreas and the liver into the duodenum. Okay, right. So, um, this pancreatic duct system that I've just shown, this is only the huge great duct system. Of course, coming off this, and I'll try and rectify this horrid little blotch on the drawing here, you'll have loads of little other ducts coming off here, okay, which will all be draining into this system, and these little ducts will have even tinier little ducts coming off them, okay? Right, so what I now want to draw is one of these smaller duct systems um, so that we can have a look at the actual exocrine cells which are going to be secreting stuff into uh, these ducts. Okay, so now what we're going to draw is a much, much smaller duct, okay, and off these little ducts you have structures that are again known as asini, okay, so just like the asini that we saw in the submucosal glands of the lung, we have asini coming off the ducts of the pancreas. Okay, so here is a pancreatic duct with a asinus coming off here. Okay, so this structure is an asinus. Okay, and again, the epithelium is a cuboidal epithelium, so quite tall cells, uh, but not ciliated. Okay, so here are our epithelial cells. Okay, so we have ep asina epithelial cells, which are the epithelial cells uh, facing into this asinus here. So these 
cells which I'm going to colour in in green, we can call these asana cells. Okay, and indeed they are called asana cells. So I'll just enable that up. That's going to be called an asana cell. And we'll see what these asana cells are going to be secreting in a moment. And then we're going to have duct cells here in orange, which will be lining the duct. Now, interdispersed among the duct cells, and I regret now drawing the asana cells in green, okay, because my sort of typical colour for showing these cells was green, okay, uh, but interdispersed among the duct cells and now shown in turquoise rather than green, you're going to have some goblet cells, which we've met before. Goblet cells, remember, secrete the glycoprotein mucin, okay, which makes uh, water. Um, more viscous, okay, and turns a serous secretion into a mucus secretion. Okay, so interdispersed among the normal duct cells in orange, you're going to have goblet cells. So this is a goblet cell, and these are duct cells. Okay, right, so let's now talk about the different secretions that are going to be uh, produced by these different cells. Okay, so the asana cells will produce a primary secretion, okay, and we have seen this all before. It is the exact same mechanism that we have seen in the lungs, okay? So if I bring back up that picture that we have from the lungs, this picture here, this is exactly what is going to happen in these asana cells in the pancreatic asini, okay? So again, you're going to have sodium potassium ATPases on the basolateral membrane, establishing the sodium and potassium gradients. The NKCC is going to bring chloride anions into the cytoplasm along with sodium and potassium. The potassium is going to cycle back out for a potassium channel. Sodium, of course, is going to cycle back out through the sodium potassium ATPase. The chloride is then going to go out of the apical membrane through CFTR. So CFTR, again, is used in these pancreatic asana cells, okay? And then, of course, sodium and water are going to follow by the paracellular route. Okay, so you're going to be producing a primary secretion, again, uh, by these asana cells that line the asana. Okay, so uh, this is... Um, a primary secretion, okay, and I will just jot down there that this is CFTR dependent, okay, so without CFTR there's going to be problems with the production of that primary secretion, okay, so I'll underline this in red here. Right, now the asana cells actually do more than that in the pancreas, they don't just produce the primary secretion, they actually also chuck other things into the primary secretion. Okay, now what do they chuck in? They chuck in digestive enzymes. So enzymes that are going to be uh, delivered to the duodenum lumen in order to digest uh, things that are in the food. Okay, so digestive enzymes are also going to be put into the primary secretion by the asana cells. So this is another function of the asana cells, to put in digestive enzymes. Okay, right, so this primary secretion containing digestive enzymes then is going to be delivered into the duct uh, by the asinus here. So the asinus is going to be secreting this primary secretion with digestive enzymes in. This is going to be going into the duct. What then are the duct cells going to do? And what are the goblet cells going to do? Well, we know what the goblet cells are going to do. They're going to be chucking in mucin into this secretion. The duct cells are going to be adding more fluid into the secretion, okay? So these are responsible for adding more um, fluid into the secretion and also making the solution alkaline. So I want to talk about this in a little bit more detail because this is a new mechanism, okay? And again, this addition of fluid by the duct cells, they're going to be putting in water, okay? Uh, along with more solute. Specifically, they're going to be adding sodium bicarbonate, okay? Um, but uh, the addition of this fluid with sodium bicarbonate solute is going to be CFTR dependent. Okay, so this is going to go in cystic fibrosis as well. Okay, so I want to now describe to you this mechanism then. Okay, I'm just wondering if we're going to have space here. I suppose if I make the cell very tall, like this. Okay, so here is our, whoops, just to finish that up. Here is our duct cell here, okay, and on either side we have our um, tight junctions as always, okay, so we have our basolateral membrane here, so this is the basolateral membrane, 
and then we have our apical membrane over here. Okay, right. So, um, starting the whole process off then, firstly, of course, you're going to have the sodium-potassium ATPase. This starts everything off, always, in these processes. Okay, so here is the sodium-potassium ATPase. Okay, chucking three sodiums out. Okay, and I apologise for it getting a little bit squashed. And two potassiums in. Okay, right, and establishing the sodium and potassium gradients across the cell membrane. Then it's the same old story for a while, at least anyway. Okay, again you've got NKCC working here. Okay, this will be bringing in a sodium, a potassium, and two chlorides. Okay, so here are the two chlorides. Okay, and I'll colour in NKCC here in blue. Okay, so again, it will be using the electrochemical gradient of sodium across the cell membrane to bring in a sodium ion along with a potassium ion and then two chloride anions. Okay, right. The potassium will then be leaving the cell through some potassium channel, which I'll draw here. Okay, and I really should have done this over the other page. Never mind. Okay, here is the potassium leaving out. I need this space uh, for something else later. Okay, so here's our potassium moving out through that potassium channel. The chloride anions will then be secreted onto the apical surface through CFTR. Okay, so this is exactly what we've already seen, but it's now going to change. I'm going to add a little bit more in. Okay, so the chloride anions are being secreted onto the apical surface through CFTR. Okay, and I'll colour in CFTR in vivid purple here. Now, the chloride anions are then going to be removed from the apical surface, okay, and brought back in in exchange for something else being moved out. Okay, so there is actually going to be an exchanger here, which I will colour in in orange. Okay, so this is the new part that we're now studying. Okay, so you're going to bring a chloride anion back in, okay, and you're going to chuck out another anion, which is going to be a bicarbonate anion. Okay, so this is what's known as a chloride bicarbonate exchanger. Okay, and I'll show you the structure of a bicarbonate anion in a moment. Okay, so this is a chloride bicarbonate exchanger, and it doesn't require ATP to do that. It's using the fact that chloride is going to be higher on the apical surface, okay, to drive the movement of the bicarbonate out. Okay, so this is a chloride bicarbonate exchanger here. Okay, right. So the structure of bicarbonate then, the structure of bicarbonate looks like so. You have a carbon double bound to an oxygen here, okay, with one remaining alcohol group intact, and then also an oxygen that has a negative charge attached to it. And that's why the whole thing has a negative charge, okay? And we'll see the formation of this in just a moment, okay? So effectively, this is formed from a molecule where there was a proton attached onto here. So originally you had a molecule where you had two alcohol groups coming off here, one here and then another here. And this alcohol group here has lost its proton. The hydrogen is left, okay, leaving the oxygen with a negative charge. Okay, so that's the structure of the bicarbonate anion, and that's being moved onto the apical surface, okay, in exchange for bringing a chloride back into the cytoplasm. Okay, and then of course the chloride can just keep cycling, it can move back out through the CFTR, coming back in continuously. Okay, right. Now, where does this bicarbonate come from? Well, when you remove the bicarbonate, what you will drive is more bicarbonate to be produced. You will shift the equilibrium, okay? So basically what can happen is carbon dioxide can combine with water to form carbonic acid as an intermediate, H2CO3, which is that exact thing that I was just describing to you. Okay, so if I get rid of this negative charge here and put a proton on there, okay, to form another alcohol group, this structure this is carbonic acid, okay, or H2CO3, as shown here, okay, so this is carbonic acid here, okay, right, then carbonic acid is extremely unstable, the instant you make it, it will then dissociate, the proton will leave the carbonic acid to produce bicarbonate and a free proton, 
Okay, so that's how you create more bicarbonate, by first creating carbonic acid by combining together carbon dioxide and water, and then the carbonic acid breaks down. Okay, now, an enzyme is required to combine carbon dioxide and water together in this way, okay? And that's the enzyme carbonic anhydrase. Okay, so there's an enzyme working inside the cell, which is carbonic anhydrase, which will combine together the carbon dioxide and water into carbonic acid. Okay, right. So the instant you remove bicarbonate from the cytoplasm of the cell, you will drive the, this reaction forward, okay? Because usually it's an equilibrium, okay? It's a reversible reaction. Carbon dioxide and water can combine together to make carbonic acid, which can fall apart into bicarbonate and a proton, but it can also go the other way. Bicarbonate can combine with a proton to form carbonic acid, which can then fall apart into carbon dioxide and water. Okay, but if you remove bicarbonate, you will drive the equilibrium towards producing more bicarbonate. Okay, and then, hence, you'll produce more bicarbonate, which can then be moved out by this uh, chloride bicarbonate exchanger. Okay, right. So, the only thing then that you need to do is bring in more carbon dioxide and water. Okay, well, carbon dioxide is a non-polar molecule and therefore can just diffuse through the cell membrane easily. You also probably should remember that it's the uh, byproduct of all respiration, okay? Uh, or at least um, aerobic respiration. So, uh, it's not too difficult to get hold of carbon dioxide. So, that's not too difficult to come by. Okay, water is a little bit more difficult because that has to uh, be moved across the membrane by a protein because it is a very polar molecule and therefore finds it difficult to move through uh, a bilayer of lipids. Okay, so there are special molecules that can help move water across the cell membrane into the cell and those are known as aquaporins. Okay, so that square that I've just shown there, that's an aquaporin on the basolateral side of this duct cell. Okay, right, so I'll colour in the aquaporin in vivid purple there. Okay, so providing you're bringing in water and carbon dioxide, you can sustain this reaction. There is one other little problem, which is that you produce a proton every time you make bicarbonate. Okay, so you don't want the cell to fill up with protons because protons are very dangerous, potentially. You're making the cytoplasm more and more acidic. So you need to get rid of that, okay? And the way that you get rid of that is for a sodium proton exchanger, again driven by the sodium gradient across the cell membrane. So you bring a sodium in and a proton out, okay? So this is a sodium proton exchanger here. Okay, so that's how you can continually produce more uh, bicarbonate, basically. Okay, so I'll just colour in this sodium proton exchanger in red there. Okay, right. So, that's how we can continue this reaction going, and therefore continue to secrete more and more bicarbonate onto the apical surface of the cell. Okay, now, not all of the chloride will be replaced by bicarbonate. It's worth making sure that you understand that. Only a bit of the chloride will be replaced with bicarbonate. But through this means, we are secreting chloride onto the apical surface and some bicarbonate, okay? Some of the chloride that we're secreting is exchanged for bicarbonate, and therefore we're putting chloride anions and bicarbonate onto the apical surface of these duct cells. Now, of course, again, you have the problem that you are effectively moving negative charge from the... Um, basolateral extracellular fluid to the apical extracellular fluid. Okay, so what's going to happen is positively charged ions are going to follow by the paracellular route, particularly sodium is going to move, so you're going to be secreting sodium chloride and sodium bicarbonate, okay, and also water is then going to follow the solute, okay, by osmosis. Okay, so these duct cells then are adding sodium chloride and sodium bicarbonate into the secretion here, okay? And they are also secreting more water, so they're adding fluid into the pancreatic secretion. So it's not just the asana cells here that are actually secreting fluid into uh, the lumen of this pancreatic duct system, okay? The duct cells are also doing that. And then we've got the goblet cells which are putting in mucus. Okay, right, so let's now think about what's going to happen in cystic fibrosis. 
Oh, actually, just before I do that, let me just um, tell you what the purpose of this bicarbonate is. So bicarbonate is a alkaline molecule, okay? It's a base. It is capable of accepting a proton and then combining into carbonic acid, okay? Molecules which can accept protons are by definition bases. They make the pH higher, okay? They reduce proton concentration in a solution, okay? Why is this so important? Well, because what is upstream of the duodenum? The stomach. The stomach is not shown here, but it will be here. Okay, the stomach has an incredibly high concentration of protons in its uh, solution, okay, in the liquid that's in the lumen of the stomach, okay, famously so, okay, everyone knows that the stomach is full of acid, okay, this acid is going to be moving into the duodenum, and we want to neutralize that now, we don't want the same pH uh, in the duodenum, okay, so that's why we are adding the alkaline uh, bicarbonate to the pancreatic solutions to try and neutralize the stomach acid, basically, and uh, raise the pH back up, because, of course, when you've got a very high proton concentration, you've got a very low pH. Remember the um, logarithmic negative logarithmic relationship between pH and proton concentration. Okay, so that's the function of the bicarbonate to try and neutralize stomach acid that's going to be coming through. Okay, right. Now let's think about what's going to happen in cystic fibrosis then. So in cystic fibrosis, the CFTR, cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator, is broken in both the duct cells and the asthma cells. Okay, so again, let's imagine that we've got a double delta F508 mutation in our maternal and paternal CFTR gene. What that's going to result in is most of the proteins misfolding, getting destroyed by the um, cells degradation machinery. A few lucky CFTRs will make it to the cell membrane, but will have hugely reduced CFTR function. Okay, so we're going to now secrete much, much less of this primary secretion of water and salt from the asthma cells, and we're also going to secrete much less fluid from the duct cells, okay? But you'll still be making the digestive enzymes, and you'll still be making the mucin from the goblet cells, so you end up with a really, really thick, viscous pancreatic solution. Or, or pancreatic secretion, rather. And again, this just doesn't move through the pancreatic ducts. You end up with pancreatic ducts, which are just full of this thick, sticky secretion. Okay, so if I draw this in, the pancreatic ducts just get full of this thick, sticky secretion. Okay, and this blocks um, the digestive enzymes from actually getting into the duodenum. So secretions into the duodenum stop basically. Okay, in addition, you get digestive enzymes getting stuck behind, basically. Okay, and these swell up into huge fluid accumulations, and that's the cysts, okay? So you get cysts forming, which are fluid accumulations, which are um, digestive enzymes being secreted uh, and getting stuck behind mucus plugs, basically, that are in the, uh, digest the pancreatic ducts here. Okay, so that's the cysts that form in the pancreas in cystic fibrosis. Okay, in addition, uh, you get um, fibrosis of the pancreatic tissue. So a lot of the pancreatic tissue starts to degenerate, okay, because it's not being used, and also because the digestive enzymes are being accumulated there, and these are very dangerous enzymes, okay, so they are not good to have around. They digest proteins and fat. Okay, two of the key um, key um, components of cells. Okay, so they end up destroying the local tissue, and then the tissue has to be replaced by something. So what happens is the body replaces it with scar tissue, and the fancy word for scar tissue is fibrosis, okay, or fibrotic tissue. So you get fibrosis, which is the production of scar tissue. So I'll just show some scar tissue by this red area. So we've got the fibrosis there. So you end up with a pancreas full of cysts, these accumulations of fluid, and also fibrosis, and that's the origin of cystic fibrosis being called cystic fibrosis. 
Okay, so that's what happens in the pancreas. Now let's think about the wider consequences of this for the entire body. Okay, you're now not getting these enzymes, these digestive enzymes, which particularly are important for digesting fats and proteins going into the duodenum. Okay, so this means that your uh, digestion of fats and proteins goes down. Okay, and if you don't digest them into smaller pieces, you can't actually absorb them. Okay, so you now get malabsorption, okay, and then malabsorption of nutrients then leads to malnutrition, okay, and if you don't have the building blocks for making cells, then you aren't going to grow particularly well, so generally people with cystic fibrosis don't grow that well, okay, so they ended up with stunted growth. Okay, other symptoms that are response, well, are caused by this um, are the foul-smelling, very large stools that are produced, okay, and that's simply because you're not digesting the fats and the proteins, so you're hardly digesting much of what you eat, okay, and therefore it just passes straight through, okay, and uh, there is a fancy word for this which I'll put here, which is steatorrhea, okay, so steatorrhea refers to a lot of fat present in the faeces. Okay, and that's all caused by the lack of the digestive enzymes that should be being produced by the pancreas. Okay, right. Uh, so, um, that I think we will conclude there with this video. Um, that's the pancreas finished. In the next video, what we will do is we will move on to looking at the actual intestine itself, because intestinal cells, uh, certain intestinal cells use CFTR again to secrete uh, fluid which mixes with mucin to produce mucus, and when those uh, fluid secreting cells stop working because of the mutations in the CFTR, uh, that also produces a too thick mucus on the surface of the intestine, and that can lead to problems with the lubrication of food boluses through the intestinal lumen, okay, and then lead to compaction and obstruction. Okay, so we'll look at that in the next video.